Our scripture today is from James 1, 9 through 11, and chapter 2, 1 through 13. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with a scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor at my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whosoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The word of the Lord. Kids are dismissed if they'd like to head out to Children's Church. And in the meantime, Micah is free to come up here. He's so excited about that. Hi, Micah. I gave him a heads up this time. One moment as we uh, grab a few others. Oh, feel free. Join me up here, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, Mr. Micah. We're all pretty, I think, at this point, familiar with the world's famous Tupperware. Thank you. Thank you. I was informed by my community group, this is not Tupperware. It is Rubbermaid or some knockoff, and I should stop calling it Tupperware. And I'm not. <laughs> so we're not going to undo this, but lest you forget this, this wonderful, beautiful prop uh, is, in, for our purposes today, reminding us of what James talks about in the very first verse, James chapter 2, verse 1, right? He talks about our belief, our faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we use this prop to remind us of our faith, of what it is that you and I believe, what we grab hold of. And we say, this is what is true. This is my core identity. This is my significance. This is my worth. This is everything. Because inside the Father, right? God the Father, big box. Inside it is Christ. And inside that box, right? Like Russian stacking dolls, what's in, inside Christ? Yeah. Any person who's placed their faith in Jesus, right? Because the word of the Lord says that when you and I place our faith in Jesus, where we are, who we are, changes. That we become hidden with Christ inside God the Father. This is, this is the picture of who you and I have. So we're going to give that. If you'd be so kind, sir, just grab hold that for me. Thanks. Keep holding that. <laughs> you have a tough job today, friend. See if you can handle it. So that's the picture, right? of who we are and what we have. That's the gospel that we get to hold on to. That is our faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. This box, uh, 
I was gifted by the, my community group. They gave me like 10 things of Tupperware. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. Okay, this one is going to represent favoritism, prejudice, discrimination. Because what the word actually says, what that verse says, in the literally translated in the Greek, James says, do not hold your faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ and favoritism. And the Greek word is kind of cool, right? I, I, I won't, I try not to tell you Greek words, but this one's kind of cool, right? It literally translates into receive the face. Right, that's a word picture, isn't it, for what favoritism looks like, for what prejudice looks like? It, it means that you and I look at somebody and based off their face, based off some kind of external circumstance, off of their appearance, we look and we say, I either receive you or I reject you based strictly off of what I see. And the example that James is going to give us here in chapter 2 is I look at somebody and I receive or reject based off of whether or not I think your socioeconomic status is significant enough. Right? You're in a high enough tax bracket that I would look at you and say, that person has value and significance. But we do this. Right? We show favoritism in all kinds of different ways. We receive or we reject people based off their face when we look at their skin color. And we say, you look like me, or you don't look like me. Or you look like a race and ethnicity that I'm comfortable with, or you look like one that I'm going to cross the street for. And we receive and we reject by the face, right? Sometimes we receive or reject people by the face based off of their gender or their age. Maybe we look at them and they have tattoos, or they don't have tattoos, and we say, I've made a decision. Sometimes we do it based off of their body. If I look at you and you look like you take good care of yourself and you're, you're pretty lean and you're in good shape, and I'll say, ah, I like this person. And if I look and say, I don't know, they look pretty overweight, I bet they're lazy. I receive and reject based off of all kinds of things. Sometimes it's the way they speak, sometimes it's the way they act. You get the point. James says that what we are not to do is to do what we're about to make Micah do. Which one's your dominant hand? Great. Could you just um, give me your left? Oh, thanks. Got it? No, 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 Bren, just with your left. You're going to need your right hand. Thank you. Good job. Could you do me a favor? Yeah. Could you just, like, walk? <laughs> yeah. That's all I need. You got this. You're good. Oh, just keep going. <laughs> Look at you. Such great balance. All those workouts with Greg are paying off. Could you, oh, don't open the door for him, Gary. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. You can come back. Oh, you're doing a great job. Thank you. I like it. That's good. I'm glad you didn't drop it on anybody's head. That would hurt them. You're doing well. How you doing? Doing good? Did you feel balanced? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> Still feel balanced? No. <laughs> If you want to sit that there, that would be great. Thank you, sir. That's all I needed. You can sit. Beautiful. He did such a lovely job. I was really hoping he'd drop one. James says that there's a problem when Christians try to do what we just made poor Micah do. When we make this decision to say, in one hand, I hold on to the glorious Lord Jesus Christ and my faith in him, that, that everything, that all of my security and purpose, uh, all of my significance and anyone's is found in whether or not they are in Christ, hidden with him in God the Father. And we try to add something else. That your significance is this and... Uh, if you make enough money, and if you're the right race, and if you're the right political party, and if I like you. And he says, we have a major issue. The problem is we get off balance. We start walking uh, crooked and cockeyed, and we, we struggle to be able to hold on to both. Eventually, one of them's going to fall, and you're going to have to grab something. And actually, the very language that James uses later on in verse 4 showed up in chapter 1. And you'll remember the very first sermon that we had in this series, our very first teaching, we talked about how James calls us to not be double-minded. 
someone who's doubting God, who says, yes, Lord, I believe everything is tied up in who we are in Christ, sort of. But it also is whatever it is that my prejudices lie in. When you and I doubt God, we end up walking cockeyed. We, we, we go back and forth like a wave is tossing us in the sea. And James is about to call us out for it. And not just to call us out for it individually, and not to call us out for it outside the doors. He calls us out for it in here. In his church. In the body. James says if we're going to deal with prejudice and discrimination, that it better start here. Because, he says, the moment that you and I try to grab both and hold on to both and say, yep, everything's in who we are in Christ, and my little bit of favoritism, he says that's when things in church go very, very wrong. That it will look like how he described. It will look like seeing... uh, his hypothetical, right, is seeing someone walk in the doors of this church. So maybe they're a visitor, and maybe you know them. They walk in, and they're dressed nicely. They look like they got dressed that morning to come to church. And so you look at them, and you say, aha, you look like me. Maybe they're the right skin color. You talk like me. They don't have a funky accent. Uh, and then maybe you, you have a chat with them for a little bit, and you go, you fit my box. You may come. And so we look at that person and we say, come here, have a seat. We have a wonderful seat for you. You don't have to sit up front, the preacher spits, but you can sit. (laughs) Maybe you invite him to sit in your pew. You invite him uh, to introduce him to some of your friends. Say, we're going to get lunch later on because they look good so they can sit here. But then James says, imagine that behind that person comes someone who does not fit in your box. That behind that person comes the example he gives is a homeless individual. And they haven't showered. And they haven't been able to wash their clothes. And they stink. Like, to high heaven. And they walk in. And your first thought is, I wonder if they want a gift card. They're probably here just for that. They walk in and you go, I don't know about this guy. We should watch him. He might steal our hymnals. Because let me tell you, those are a hot commodity. <laughs> he walks in, and you look at him, and it's church, so you're not allowed to say, oh, please don't be here. But instead you say, in James's hypothetical, instead of looking at him and saying, here, I've got a great seat for you, you say, i got a cheap seat for you. And actually the way that James phrases it is he says, uh, imagine that you look at that person and you say, come here, you can sit The Greek literally says, under my stool. You sit there. We don't want to see you. We don't want you up front. But you can be here, but you get a cheap seat. You get the picture? Now here's the deal. And I mean this in the most loving way I know how to say it. I have never one time in my whole life been a part of a church that didn't do that. Including this one. I've never been part of a church where people didn't have something, where we looked at someone else and we said, you, come here, have a seat. But then we looked at someone else and said, under my stool. And sometimes it is about money. Sometimes it's we look at someone and we go, I think they have a rough background. I don't think they're going to fit in real well with us. So we'll give them a seat in a pew, but we won't give them a seat in leadership. Or we'll give them a seat in the church, but we won't give them a seat at our dinner table because they don't fit our box, even though they do, in fact, fit in God's. Every one of us does this. We all know that it happens beyond the walls, friends. But if things are going to change outside there, they got to start here. They start with a church that is the most diverse community around. You know, when Jesus called his church, he did not say, I'm calling you to sit in pews with people who fit in your box. I'm calling you to sit in pews with people who look like you, talk like you, act like you, who think like you, who see the world like you. He said, I'm calling you to sit in pews with people who are radically different and fundamentally the same because everything about who they are is in Christ. This is what a church is meant to look like. You know, the church of Jesus Christ should be the most colorful place we find 
It should have the most range in ages. It ought to have the most distinct personalities because it's filled with people who are in Jesus and who have said, this is the only thing that matters. So how do we get there? I figured today's message could go one of two ways. One, I could list every single possible way that you and I show favoritism and prejudice and discrimination. And that sounds like oodles of fun. Or, we could just fix our eyes on the one thing that overcomes favoritism and prejudice and discrimination. And that's what James does. Now James says, brothers and sisters, don't do it. Do not try to grab the glorious Lord Jesus Christ and your faith in him and prejudice. You can't balance both. One's got to go. And then he just talks about how we get rid of the prejudice. How we grab with firmer grip on the glorious hope we have in Jesus. And so here's what James invites us to do. And here's what I'm going to invite us to do. We need to see, friends, that our glorious Lord Jesus Christ shows us two things. First, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, he shows them, whoever them is, his glory. And if he does, then who are we as his people to do any different? So look at what James says in uh, verse 5. James says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, hasn't God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of this world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom that he promised those who love him? But you, you've insulted the poor. Isn't it the rich who are exploiting you? Aren't they the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? Do you hear how he started it? James says, friends, how can you look? And in his category, it's the poor, right? He says, how can you look at the poor and look at them with disdain and dishonor and say, you get a cheap seat? When Jesus looks at the poor and he says, I take them and I hide them in me. Jesus says it doesn't matter if the poor person is low in the eyes of this world. If the poor person has placed their faith in Christ, then he says, I put them in me. Now, don't misunderstand, James. He is not saying that by virtue of being poor, you get one day to go to heaven. He's saying that Jesus is looking, that God the Father is looking, that the Holy Spirit looks at every single person, including the lowliest of the low, the person who's most dishonored and disdained, who the world would look at and say, you get a cheap seat. And Jesus says, if they place their faith in me, they get the best seat, because they get to be in me. That's what James said in chapter 1. We had Barbie read that for us uh, here this morning. He says, The brother in humble circumstances should take pride in his high position. Because the person who is lowest to the low in the world, if they are in Christ, are seated with Christ right now, already in the heavenlies, at the right hand of God the Father. That means I don't get to look at someone and reject them by the face. If Jesus looked at them and said, that person, that person gets to be with me for all of eternity. The same, by the way, is true for the rich. And don't misunderstand James. He does go on and say, in their context, isn't it the rich who are not acting like believers? Isn't it the rich who are exploiting you? And he's going to get real specific about calling those of us who are financially secure out later on in this book. But James also says in chapter 1, hey, rich person, God shows you too. And here's the deal. In heaven, there are no cheap seats. There also aren't box seats. Okay? I don't care how affluent you are. You can't buy your position in heaven. You cannot earn your place at the table. At the foot of the cross is in fact level. There are just him, his seats. So the rich among us, are also chosen. We are chosen to place our faith in Jesus Christ. And you could replace James's example with anything. If your core prejudice is race-related, how dare you 
Look at someone whose skin color is different than yours, who God has chosen and said, if they place their faith in me, then they are secure, hidden in Christ, in the Father. And look at them like they're less than you. Because if you're in Christ and they're in Christ, then that would make you equal. Period. I don't care what your prejudice is based on. If you and I look and see that the glorious Lord Jesus Christ shows them glory, then we find ourselves going, Lord, I can't, can't look at that person and shove them in the cheap seats. But here's another thing. He doesn't just show them his glory. He also shows us his glory. Verse 8 says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, well, then you're doing well. (laughs) Amen. If any of us actually kept that royal law, and what he means by that is this, this is what the kingdom of God looks like, right? Jesus was asked, what are the most significant laws? And he said, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what his kingdom is meant to be. And if we are the representatives of the king, then we are called to keep the royal law, to love our neighbor. But here's a little newsflash. We don't do such a great job. When Jesus defined loving our neighbor, he said that loving our neighbor meant we didn't just love people who were like us. We don't just love people who look like us and act like us and think like us. Actually, Jesus defined loving your neighbor as loving your enemy. That means loving the person right here in these pews. We'll just stay here for a minute. Who irritates the living daylights out of you. It means loving the person that you look at and you say, you do not fit in my box. Because I act this way and you act that way. Because I look this way and you look that way. Because I voted this way at that business meeting and I haven't forgiven you 20 years later. You voted the other way. Well, you all laugh, but some of you should say, ouch. (laughs) Jesus talks about loving your neighbor as loving your enemy. He also talks about it as loving the person who is totally unlike you. So think the good Samaritan, right? Jesus told that story to say this is what it looks like to love your neighbor. None of us do it perfectly. And so that's why James goes on in verse 9 and he says, but if you show favoritism, if you reject or receive somebody based on the face, you sin and you are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law, like does everything right, but stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For the same one who said don't commit adultery also said don't murder. If you don't commit adultery, but you do commit murder, then you have become a law breaker. You know, the reality is, I am a law breaker. Not because I've broken some laws, but because I've looked at my God who speaks the laws, and I've said to him, no. That's the issue, right? It's not that I've done wrong, it's that I have looked God in the eye and said, you don't get to be my king. The reality is, friends, that if you took James's same scenario, but you made it between me and Jesus and not a homeless person and a rich person, then I'm the homeless person in that scenario. When I walk in front of Jesus as a lawbreaker who so rarely loves people the way I'm called to love them, who really, really likes my own little box, and I want to only be surrounded by people in my own little box, When I stand before Jesus, I'm the homeless person. I stink with my sin. I am covered by it. He should look at me at best and say, I won't kick you out, but sit underneath my footstool. That's what I deserve. But you and I both know what Jesus does instead. And Jesus looks at me, at the lawbreaker, and instead of saying, you get the cheap seat, he says, I'll give up my seat so you can have mine. That's what he's done. That's why this matters. That's why I actually have security and significance and worth, because the one who's got the best seat in the house gave it up for me, the lawbreaker. Because the one who was wearing royal robes took them off and put on my filthy rags so I could be made cleansed. Because the one who was high and exalted went low so I can be lifted up. 
That's the gospel. And the more that truth gets into your heart and into my heart, the harder it becomes to do the stupid balancing act. Because all of a sudden I find myself looking at my tiny little box going, what am I doing? If God looks at the person who doesn't fit my box and he looks at them and says, I chose them. And he chooses me, of all people. Then who am I to deny that person the power of the gospel? I think that's why James's very next statement is so speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. That's not a threat, by the way. That's an amazing promise. See, my God has shown me his glory, and I am secure in Christ, hidden with him in God the Father, and one day I will stand before him for judgment. And he should say, don't even sit beneath my feet, get out. But what he's going to say instead is you're completely free. You are totally forgiven. And you get to enter into glory, actually loving your neighbor the way you have not been able to up until this point. One day I'm going to be judged and given freedom. And that's why today I speak and act differently. Friends, we all know that the world we live in is one that's marked by prejudice and discrimination, by trying to put people in a little tiny box. It changes here. The church should be the one place that anybody can walk into and say, there, I wasn't judged based off my face. I was given an invitation to know the one who loves me. So what do we do? Well, here's your homework. Homework assignment number one. As always, the invitation is you do this on your own with Jesus and then that you invite someone else into the conversation. First thing is look in. Every one of us is carrying around the other little box, my friend. There is something, some way that we show favoritism and prejudice and discrimination right here with this group of people. And none of this conversation matters unless you first look in and say, what's my box? You know, what's the other thing I'm holding on to where I'm saying, this is the person can have real worth if they know Jesus and they fit my box. So what's in yours? That's where this conversation has to start. Then after you've looked in, I want you to speak out. I want you to speak out first by confessing. Right? Saying to the Lord and saying to someone that you trust, this is my struggle. I, I, I don't look at people at a different age bracket and invite them to have a good seat. I tell them, hey, you can be here, but sit down there. Or I don't look at people of a different color. I don't look at people who vote differently than me. What is it? Speak out, tell somebody, so that there is accountability. But then also, learn how to speak the gospel. When you talk about that person or that group of people, and when you talk to them, remember to ground everything in this truth. Their worth, their value is not found in fitting in your box. It's found here. Boy, what changes when we start talking to each other? The gospel. And here's the last one, and pretty much the only time I'll encourage you to act up, like ever. I ran out of prepositions. I want you we got to start thinking about what does it look like to actually start giving a seat, and not a cheap seat, to the people that we sometimes struggle with, the people we would, we would discriminate against. And I think that's super, super practical. It means like saying, hey, come sit with me in the same pew, and let's get to know each other. It means, friends, that our leadership, like positions of leadership in this church, should look diverse. Diverse in age, diverse in gender, diverse in color, diverse in every way because we're looking at people and saying you got a seat at the table and it's not a cheap one. But I also think it looks like saying and we invite people to sit at our own tables. People that ordinarily wouldn't fit in our box but they do fit in the Lord's. That's how we bring change. That's how we become a people who more and more only grasp our faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ and a church that's marked by it. Let's pray together. 
this morning as you come before the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to pray. If you need to come this morning and you need to confess that you've been trying to balancing act, that right here in this church you've been showing favoritism and discrimination, then confess it. If you want to come before the Lord Jesus this morning and say, I want to know the truth of your gospel and grab hold of it for me and for others, then invite him to make that transformation real in your life. Father, I ask for, for myself and for all my brothers and sisters here that first you would convict me, Lord. Convict me of my little box. Convict me of the ways that, that I want to hold on to saying significance is, is found in you and. Lord, show me where favoritism is present. Show me the ways that I judge people receive and reject by their face. And as you show me that, God, would you drive me deeper and deeper to the gospel? Lord, increasingly, may we be a church that is so defined by our faith in the glorious Lord Jesus. A church filled with people who genuinely believe that you show them your glory just like you've shown it to us. And Lord, as you transform us, I pray that a year from now, five years from now, we're looking around and we're saying, Lord, we can see the evidence of how you have invited us to be a church that is so committed to the work of the gospel. Lord, we pray these things in your name and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand.